So this week we'll go through the tidy data chapter and I've kind of managed to go through most of the exercises and write down sort of neat solutions, but there are a few that um, I haven't done, but we can certainly discuss uh, how we'd approach them together. Um, so what is tidy data? Tidy data is uh, basically described by three criteria. Uh, it's a data set where each variable um, is in a column and each observation is then in a row. And each value that's defined by a column and a row must have just a single, sorry, like, yeah, each cell described by a column and a row must have a single value as opposed to, let's say, a list or any other sort of collection of values together. And the reason that, oh yeah, some examples, for example, of non-tidy data is here, where, for example, the rate column contains the number of cases uh, and the population of a country in a given year um, separated by this slash. So this basically doesn't fit the criteria of tidy data because it contains two variables in one column. Another example is when basically some values, that is years in this case, are encoded in column names. So here, um, basically one variable is in the column names, the other variable, that is country, is uh, in, in this row. And the third variable, which is basically the count of cases in this instance, uh, is in the cells. So that too makes it difficult to work with this data frame because each variable sort of is found in a different place. And the advantages of using tidy data as opposed to uh, these uh, examples is first of all to have a consistent way of storing data uh, and specifically since R basically works really well with vectors having each of your variables as a column uh, can then lead to sort of performance um, improvements. So the first question was to basically describe in prose each of the different tables that are available through Tidyverse and I have the tables here on the right hand side. Um, so the first table is the only um, sort of example of tidy data where each basically each row shows the number of cases and populations in each country and year combination. Um, so here the variables of country, year, cases and population are in different columns and each observation in its own row and each cell, each value basically corresponds to a single um, um, yeah, observation. Table two uh, basically has rows which basically correspond to um, country and year combinations and then uh, this type uh, column is either case or population and it basically shows the count for each of these two variables. Um, Table three, which is another non-tidy example, um, uh, contains uh, country and year combinations, but in the rate, uh, it contains two variables, uh, as we've sort of discussed earlier. Um, and it is compact and it's good for sort of visualizing or displaying the data, but it's not very useful because this basically the rate column is a character. So it can't really be immediately easily used in any further downstream analysis. And tables 4a and 4b um, basically show a number of cases in the case of 4a and the population of the countries in 4b for, a, um, for the different years, again, in the, in the um, uh, column names as we discussed earlier. Did anyone have any questions or oppositions to these descriptions? No, I'm good. And the second question sorry, was basically about, um, I guess like the point of it is to show um, the ease of working with tidy data as opposed to non-tidy data. So we're asked to calculate the rate uh, of tuberculosis in each country using table two and table 4a and 4b uh, as our input. Uh, and the instructions are around 
basically extracting the number of cases per country and the population and calculating the rate and storing it back in the appropriate place, which I took to mean the same table, just like this data added back in it. Um, so here's how I approached using table two uh, and following these instructions. So first, I took the number of cases by filtering the type to be equal to cases and then removed the type column. And similarly, I got a second uh, data frame for the population. I joined the two data frames on country and year, uh, oh, sorry, and gave them um, a suffix reflecting basically what it is. So the underscore cases suffix for the cases and underscore population for the population, which is basically the right table. Uh, then calculated the rate based on this formula here. Um, and selected the relevant columns and then joined it to my table two and arranged it the same way table two was arranged. So here you can see the highlighted columns are basically the rates calculated based on this method that they suggested. Um, and yeah, and I've basically inserted it back into table two. So you can see cases divided by the population multiplied by 10,000 should give this value. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm like pivoting is covered later on, but if I were approaching this problem, I would have used pivot. So I thought I'd also show that, which is a lot shorter and a lot easier to read. So uh, here, basically, the type uh, needs to be pivoted wider uh, to cases and population, which is what I did, um, and then did the same calculation and sort of um, yeah arranging like I did before. And for using table 4A and 4B, um, I've only really done it using pivot because I think like this would have taken, you know, many, many more lines unless, I don't know, if you've come up with a simpler way of doing it. Um, but basically, 4A kind of looks like has year in uh, the column name. So I first pivoted longer in order to add this as a year column and added these values in for cases, which is in 4A, and population in 4B, uh, and did the same sort of join, mutate, uh, and then I pivoted it back wider into its old form. Any questions? No, it's okay. Um, I mean, I like, I like, I like pivoting, so <laughs> no big deal. But I'm just wondering why you're using uh, inner join. I mean, I could, yeah, did you use left join? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I think in this case, they have the same kind of um, uh, things in, 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 uh, in the joining column, so it will be fine. Yeah, I think, in the, yeah, I agree the equivalent in this case. Um, yeah, and for the third question, asking to recreate the plot, um, this plot is basically uh, done with table one. In order to do it with table two, I think all you need to do is filter because this is only looking at the number of cases. So since, um, yeah, so I think just filtering with type equals cases and changing this to count um, works. Any questions? No, nope, good. So then, um, the chapter talks a little bit more about pivoting. Uh, and this is quite a, basically this is like a pair of functions which are very useful when, um, when dealing with non-tidy data and wanting to sort of change its shape uh, for further downstream analysis. So most, uh, most data doesn't come in a tidy format. Either one variable is spread across multiple columns or an observation can be scattered across multiple rows. And in the case where the column names uh, are not names of the variable, but actual values, like we saw before with the, num uh, the year, then we need to use pivot longer, which basically takes a wider uh, short data frame uh, and transforms it into a more narrow, longer data frame and takes basically these names into a new variable and the values that are represented into a another variable. And in this case, uh, the sort of 
the tidiness may not be that obvious, but if you consider, for example, instead of having two years, having 20 years, you can imagine how much easier it is going to be to work with this data frame than that data frame. So the pivoted columns, which are in this case, the two year columns are dropped and their names are placed in the year column and um, the values underneath them are placed into uh, another column in this case called cases. Um, the opposite case where you have an observation stacked across multiple rows like we saw in table two, where cases and population were basically uh, in one column. Um, we basically want to make it wider so that uh, these two variables are represented by two columns as opposed to being in one uh, place. And here, again, we want to use, uh, sorry, in this case, we want to use pivot wider uh, to basically take these values and make them column names and these uh, their representative sort of values. So the questions around this. So the first one was around why they're not perfectly symmetrical. Um, and the reason for that is basically when we call pivot longer, the column names are automatically taken, uh, sorry, like converted into characters. So they're represented as strings, uh, but we can control this, sort of override this by providing a type argument if we want to. So if you do wider and then back to longer, um, what we're initially uh, sort of integers here will be converted to um, strings. But again, this can sort of be avoided by explicitly giving uh, the type argument for these columns. Yeah, so I'm wondering, um, I need to, I, I'm not so sure, but uh, so can you also use the prefix if you're trying to do pivot much longer. Uh, no, what do you mean no. by that? No, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing it up. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about if you do pivot longer first and, and then wider, then you could use prefix, I guess. No worries. Sorry. Yeah, not sure. And the second question was asking about why this code fails. Uh, so if you remember in table 4a, if I can So this is what table 4a looks like on the right. So we have country and then we have the year 1999 and 2000. Uh, so when we try to pivot longer um, here, basically if we just give integers, um, our, we'll try to find the 1999 and the 2000s columns and it fails because this data frame only contains three columns, country, 1999, 2000. Because these are non-syntactic names, they need to be um, quoted basically as a tactic. So I think also regular quotes also work to say we're talking about the string 1999, not the integer 1999. So this way, um, then there's I think the select clause underneath can actually locate these um, column names. Mm. And the third question. One second. Uh, was about how to widen this table uh, and yeah, what happens basically if you try to widen the table, how can you solve this problem? So the problem arises because uh, the combination of Philip Woods and age appears twice, first with a value of 45, then a value of 50. And again, I guess how we tackle this problem depends on what actually we want to get out of this. So if we want to maintain both of them, uh, then we basically need to introduce a way of separating this row from this row, um, which we can do by introducing um, another column, in this case I called it ID, uh, where we basically denote the row number, and then we do a pivot wider, and then we can basically separate these two columns. Whereas if we know that we only care about one instance, let's say the higher value, then we can do, uh, we can use distinct um, to basically reduce um, these sort of duplicates and then do wider. 
question four um, was about how to simplify this uh, table. And you basically need to use pivot longer because again, the male and female are actually, are not separate variables, but they are the values of the variable sex. So um, using pivot longer, which basically gets this data frame, um, where the variables of is this person pregnant, what's their sex, and uh, the number of sort of observations are three separate columns, which correspond to the three separate variables. If you want, I guess you could also remove NA because this doesn't really maybe add that much information, but again, it depends what you want to do afterwards. Yeah. Um, another sort of pair of complementary functions that are very useful when dealing with tidying data are separating and uniting. So separate splits, basically a column, at either a given position or a separator. For example, in this case, the slash would be very useful. Um, by default, it separates at any non sort of alphanumerical character, um, but you can also provide uh, either a string or a regular expression matching the separator that you want to use. So if you imagine if we had here uh, some special character that we knew uh, denotes the separation between the variables, we can control it like that. Um, yeah, using the sep argument. Um, and basically by default, the original type of this column is preserved. So in this case, this was a, a character and it will be again preserved. So the cases and population would also be character unless overridden by sort of uh, using the convert argument. Um, so if you say <clears throat> convert equals true, then um, it will basically try to predict based on what these columns look like. Um, to you basically decide on the type of the data. Um, unite is the basically opposite function, and it's used to combine different uh, sort of columns into one. Uh, and by default, the sort of separator is underscore, but that too can be overwritten uh, with any value. Uh, and exercises were about sort of further. Um, variables and controlling these functions. So what do the extra and fill arguments do in separate? Um, these are basically there in order to control for cases where not every uh, observation splits into the same number of different characters. So if you look at this, um, we basically have, with a separator of a comma, this will split into three, this will split into four, and this will split into three. And we are trying to separate it into three different columns. Um, so when you run this, basically get an error saying expected three pieces, additional pieces are discarded in row two. So this is basically the extra G character here has been discarded. Uh, and similarly, in this case, um, we basically have our second row uh, lacks uh, the third argument that we'd expect, not argument, sorry, but like the third piece that our separate function expects in its one, two, three columns. Uh, and again, by default is basically warning, telling us that the missing piece here, like the third value will be filled with uh, NA. Um, and in both of these cases, uh, the extra and the fill arguments have default values of one, which just uh, provides a warning, but this can be overwritten. So the extra argument can take one, drop or merge. And in the case that you choose drop, basically the extra um, value here will be dropped. If you choose merge, then these two will be merged together in the final column. And the fill um, argument can take one, which is the default, left or right. And these basically determine which side they are filled. So whether it's going to be uh, sort of filled on the left before the D or uh, on the right after the E. Uh, the second question was about the remove argument in both of these functions. So the remove argument basically removes the original column that's used for either the uniting or the separation uh, that we're performing. And it typically makes sense to remove it since probably you're basically converting the information into a more usable format, but you can also control this by setting it to false, therefore preserving the original um, column that you're using to generate this new column. 
Uh, I didn't have time for question three. Uh, so question three is about comparing and contrasting separate and extract. Uh, and in general, like why are there three variations of separation, but only one for unite. So extract is similar to separate, but it takes, um, instead of like a sep argument, which is basically where to separate a character, it takes a regular expression. So it's basically a lot more sophisticated than, and basically it can deal with like more diverse kinds of data than separate can. Uh, and I guess like separation is in general, like um, it lends itself to more sort of different uh, methods, whereas unite, you just bring things together. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else had anything to add. Yeah. Uh, so but, but I'm thinking if you look at uh, the, the documentation of separate under the SEP, the SEP option, you could you could use a uh, regex also. And I, I, honestly, I haven't really used um, extract that much, but I'm feeling it could do the same thing also. Separate. So right there, under SEP. Yeah. Yeah, but what I mean, yeah. Yeah, I guess, then I don't know. But I guess uh, extract is more built for, for regex. <sighs> yep, so Hava, can you um, go through the first example here in the extract? Can you go down? Yep, yes, yeah, this example, what is he saying? I fail to understand. So X column here is um, basically a string where two values are separated by this dash. Um, and what's happening here is that you basically, by default, I think it does very similar things to separate and you can extract the first value is my understanding. So if you gave like A and B here, you would get um, columns A and B, and A would contain sort of the left yeah. hand value, and B yeah. would contain the right hand side. But, okay. But just one, uh, I think you just get the left hand side. Yeah, what's the meaning of this A only? Because if you look at the, the column A, we have A. In the first argument, we have NA. In the X, we have A, B, and A, D. So we have A, A, but um, we have B and D. What's this B and D is telling us? Because... Yeah, it's basically like, if you look at the input, you have N, A, which corresponds to N, A. Then you have A dash B. And when you separate it by dash and take the first value, then you get A. It's similarly here. And here, again, if you separate it by dash, the first value is B. So you get B. Yeah, so yeah. my yeah. question yeah, my question here is when we have the extract open bracket x comma a in double quote, what this a is telling us? It's telling us that the resulting column should be called a. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, okay, so it is telling us also the first element. N no, I think that's a no. default. So, so I so if you look here, um, here basically we're saying extract values from X and put them in columns A and B, which are here, and do the extraction based on basically any number of alphanumerical characters separated by a dash. So in this case, the first value in X, so NA, a, A, B, D is here, N, A, 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 B, D. And the second value, which is going into column B, is B, D, C, E, B, D, C, E. Does that make sense? Like this is basically a chance for you to say, what will these columns be called? Okay, so in that case, in the first example, explicit, we don't need to explicitly state that we need the first element because we, don't, we didn't provide the um, regex here to extract in the first example. You understand what I mean? Like here. Yeah, but I think by default, it probably separates that 
uh, non-alphanumeric, but I need to read. Um, yeah, I, I think it takes, it uses the separator, the dash separator. Yeah. You understand my question? Because in the second example, we provide the regis, how we extract the first, the first and second, but in the first example, we didn't provide any, we only provide the name of the column, but we didn't yeah. provide how we can extract the first element, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look yeah. further down, you can see, I think this is so that you can sort of follow on the next example where you're saying not only like, I don't want any alphanumerical characters. I only want values between A and B repeat, mm -hmm. you know, at least once. So in this case, uh, the E here is an, an A. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it looks like the default separator is non-alphanumeric characters, but um, it doesn't explicitly say so here. We need to check. Yeah, it doesn't, but that's what it looks like also, I think. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, um, but what is the relation of extract and pull? Um, as far as I know, pull is basically similar, like equivalent to saying dollar sign column name, um, whereas extract is actually doing some sort of operation on the character itself. So, yeah. it said, you know, pull X A here, mm -hmm. fail because there's no column named A. So extract is doing some sort of operation on this column, X, uh, whereas pull is basically give me the column of this name. Mm. So extract works on, um, so here extract only works on the list or is it data? I mean, because I can see it's not like extracting from the data frame. I mean, columns from data frames. It's just a list of stuff like that. Just an array. I mean, vector like this. It's taking um, a column, which okay. is which has data type character, and yeah. it's extracting a substring from that. Okay. Okay. If that okay. makes sense. So extract works on column vector, right? Character vector. Yeah. Okay, cool. But I mean, you can ideally use it on, um, on, 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 on numerics, extracting some, some weird kind of uh, numbers. You I guess you have to convert it to character. Yeah, yeah. But I think what we saw earlier on with the tables was much better. We could, uh, you, you, could, you could easily extract like whatever, I don't know that was tables or previously, we looked at the uh, possibility of extracting, uh, uh, removing, for example, commas or like stars from numerics. You could extract just a numeric from, from a string. Mm -hmm. That would be better. Yeah, I guess it basically depends on what you're doing. Like, um, the argument or like a use case basically for uh, the separate is yeah. was this case where you had like uh, cases and population given as a character even yeah. though we know these are two numeric values so these really that where the slash is should yeah. be sort of a division of um, that column right so it's helpful yeah. in that case for yeah. us to say split this string uh, this character at this position or where sort of you see a non-alphanumeric value and create two new columns from the resulting sort of um, variables. Mm. So the next uh, topic is missing values. Um, and, um, so I think there was a very interesting point uh, made here about how missing values can be explicit or implicit. So they can be shown explicitly in the data by uh, NA, or they can be implicitly missing, i.e. there's just no data at that point um, without you know, like it being immediately obvious. So this example basically contained um, year, quarter, and return for some imaginary stocks. And we basically have two years and some uh, quarters in that year and return. And this uh, data frame contained both explicit uh, missing values represented by NA here, 
but also implicit the missing values because if you look closely you can see that uh, the first quarter of 2016 is missing so we have one two three four uh, corresponding to the four quarters of 2015 but only two three and four for 2016 so at a first glance you may not have noticed that but um, yeah this is basically an example of an implicitly missing data and um, one way of revealing uh, such implicitly missing data would be to pivot this uh, data frame wider so if we take uh, the names from the year and the values from the time we basically end up with um, a table where we have quarter here and each year sort of uh, as a different column and we can immediately see that the first quarter for 2016 is missing and again this is the NA value that we um, had already seen for the fourth quarter of 2015. Um, another way of seeing and also sort of filling this implicitly missing value is to use the complete function. So complete takes in uh, a column or multiple columns and, in co and it completes the data frame for all the potential combinations of these. So what we're saying here is basically take the year and quarter uh, variables and make sure that uh, all the combinations are present in the data, uh, which again surfaces this missing value, which wasn't initially obvious. So Hava, how can we use complete in the previous example, the previous one? Yeah, yeah. So stocks basically is this data frame and one way to see what's missing is to do a pivot wider. Another is just to use complete on this data frame. So without the complete, basically it's exactly the same except it doesn't have this column. If I, um, if I just show it here. So if you look on the right, uh, year contains these values as it's here. Uh, quarter contains these and the return is here. And here basically before we used complete, there was only one missing value corresponding to the fourth quarter of 2015. But now we also have the first quarter of 2016 appearing as a missing value because it was missing in our data set. So if you look, we have one, two, three, four, and we're missing the one, and then we have two, three, four. So this missing value here um, can be filled like this. Yes. Does that so make sense? Yeah, so isn't complete is more straightforward than to maybe if you have, I don't know, like large amount of data, then isn't pivoting, I don't know. Sorry, I, I couldn't follow that. Yeah, I said like um, using complete, is it more preferable or using pivot? Which one? I guess it depends. Um, if So this basically still is a tidy data frame, right? So we have the year, quarter and return, which are separate variables as columns. Whereas here we have sort of gone from a tidy data frame into a less tidy one where the year variable are now column names. So depending on what you want to do afterwards, I'd say complete is probably better because it maintains the sort of tidy nature of, um, of the data frame. But again, like if you're going to do a pivot for something else anyway, then you may as well use pivot. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, and the next uh, function mentioned here relating to missing values is the fill. Uh, so this is for cases where you have, for example, in, in data entry, uh, some values are missing, but they should be interpreted as basically the same as above. So um, in this instance, this person has uh, three treatments with a certain response uh, and their name is entered only the first time uh, it appears and, and is then missing afterwards. Uh, and in cases like this where you can infer what this is based on sort of some knowledge about data entry processes, uh, you can fill these gaps using the fill function. So if you do, uh, if you use fill uh, on the person column, these NA values are filled with uh, the previous non-NA value by default. This so is pretty cool. You know, yeah. you know the functionality in Excel, 
of doing this. Sorry? Like uh, there is a functionality in Excel for doing this. Huh. Yeah, or like when you have a pivot table, then you want to fill in the gaps and stuff like that. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't actually know about this in R. Yeah, I think it's really useful because um, it's a lot more sort of user friendly when entering data, um, mm -hmm. obviously when you're using it further downstream in a more sort of automated way, uh, those NAs can cause problems or like empty cells, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, I think it's also quite useful, but you need to make sure that you know that this NA actually means that as opposed to a missing sort of name for that person. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and some questions. Uh, basically, it's also about comparing and contrasting the fill arguments, uh, pivot wider and complete, um, which I've not had time for. So, we could look now. Oh, complete. I don't know if uh, any of you know. But, but I guess this is comparing it in, in, in time and when it comes to dealing with missing values. I guess, yeah. So it, it seemed quite similar to me when I had a quick look, but I don't know. So basically there's like values fill here, which I think is what's being referred to. Um, and it's basically what value to put in place of NAs. Uh, can be a name list or it can just be a scalar. And I think there was a similar thing here. Yeah, a named list for each variable uh, that's missing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've, I've not I had time to like go through examples and to see it in action. I guess we could move on and yeah, if, yeah, we can discuss it later on if people want to have uh, a chat around it. And the second question was about uh, the direction argument to fill. So if we go back to the example here, the direction was basically up. So in this instance, when um, in the column person, uh, when this function encountered an NA, it basically took uh, the argument from above uh, in its place. But this behavior can be changed to take uh, Catherine in this case, as opposed to Derek. Uh, so that's the that's what the direction argument does. So it determines the direction of filling missing values. Uh, and it can be down, which is default, which is what happened uh, in this example, or you can replace it to be up so that the values are filled upwards as opposed to downwards. Um, and there was a case study uh, about oops, um, using some World Health Organization data around tuberculosis cases and country. Um, but yeah, I've kind of run out of time to sort of go through a lot of this. But basically this is just to bring a lot of these functions that we went through like in the, in the chapter together. So some of the data is sort of, you can see column names here contain a lot of information where this refers to like some disease related uh, metric and this is like males between 55 and 64. So there's a bit of like pivoting and extracting, et cetera, to do in order to tidy up the data into a much more uh, usable way in our, um, yeah. Some values are dropped basically if, if it's like uh, values drop NA in uh, pivoting. Um, first question here is about. Um, and I think having a quick look through the data, there were some cases where values were zero. So it's, I think, safe to assume that NA can be dropped. Yeah, I've, uh, I've not had a lot of time to go through and checking like implicitly missing values. Um, and I actually had the chance to look through like if uh, ISO 2, ISO 3 and country are actually equivalent. And the way I looked at it was to look at the number of distinct values of the combination of uh, these three values and just the country, which is basically what we've taken in the analysis. And they have the same value. So I think 
um, I think it's reasonable to assume that they were redundant. Um, but yeah, I've not had time for the other questions. And finally, there was a note about uh, non tidy data. Um, and basically, a note to say that in some, like, not all data needs to be in this sort of tidy format. Uh, and in some cases, sort of different representations of data can have much better sort of uh, performance or space advantages when it comes to transferring or storing data. And also different fields uh, have different sort of data structures suited um, for their applications. Uh, so basically not all good data needs to come in a tidy format, but most sort of rectangular data that we typically deal with in sort of data science and analysis purposes will um, conform to these like uh, tidy data convention. Uh, so it's quite useful to look at it that way, but to also remember that uh, not all non-tidy data is messy, uh, strictly speaking. Okay. From me, we could um, either like go through these cases or can just like discuss them later on in, in the Slack channel. Nice, good presentation. Thank you. I'll stop sharing this. Okay. So I could I think I can end the recording. Good presentation, Hava. Thank you.